The internet is full of interesting stories. In the overwhelming universe of video games, there are some articles we read or videos we watch that just make our jaws drop. From the disturbing, to the amazing, to the just plain weird, strange gaming stories are something that I just can't stop researching. It's been a while since Volume 2, so for this episode I wanted to include some of the most interesting stories I've ever come across while researching video games. There's a wide mix of fun and spooky in here, so I hope that you can all enjoy. And of course, be sure to check out Volumes 1 and 2 by clicking up above, as these stories are evergreen and can be enjoyed for many years in the future. So sit back, get comfortable, and let's dive in to Strange Gaming Stories, Volume 3. Any of us old enough to remember the release of the Nintendo Wii in the mid-2000s will surely recall the absolute hysteria surrounding its scarcity. Keep in mind this was back in the day when online shopping was really just starting to come into its own, so many people were continuing to line up at Walmart or Best Buy before the doors opened, hoping to nab one of the elusive consoles. Now, perhaps this didn't quite hit the craze of Tickle Me Elmo or the Furbies from the 90s, but, you know, it was pretty close. People were willing to do crazy things to get their hands on the Nintendo Wii, but this first story proves that sometimes the risk just isn't worth it. On January 12, 2007, 28-year-old Jennifer Strange, a mother of three, had taken part in radio station KDND 107.9's Hold Your Wii for a Wii contest in a bid to win a Nintendo Wii system. The purpose of the contest was to see who could drink the most water possible without having to pee in order to win the elusive console that so many had failed to get their hands on. Jennifer entered the contest in hopes of winning the console for her children, similarly to many of the other contestants. She was notably excited to participate, but what she didn't know was that the seemingly innocent contest would be her last. As the contest began, each of the 18 contestants were given 8 ounce bottles of water to drink every 15 minutes. At first, it didn't seem very difficult, and many contestants thought that they could make it quite far into the quest for their very own Wii. Fellow contestant James Ybarra said, They were small little half-pint bottles, so we thought it was going to be easy. They told us, if you don't feel like you can do it, just don't put your health at risk. Mr. Ybarra said he quit after drinking five bottles. My bladder couldn't hold it anymore. But then things took an even more intense turn. According to Yabara, after about the fifth bottle, the remaining contestants, including Mrs. Strange, began drinking even larger bottles until eventually a winner was declared. Unfortunately, Jennifer was not it. She ended up finishing in second place after drinking over two gallons of water in a three-hour period. Throughout the contest, the DJs made sarcastic comments about the contest and Mrs. Strange in particular. You can get sick and possibly die from water intoxication. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're this yeah, they, sign, they sign releases, so we're not responsible. It's okay. And, and if they get to the point where they have to throw up, then they're going to throw up and they're out of the contest before they die. So that's good, right? Oh, that's me. Dude. Can't you get water poisoning and, like, die? Water water. Your body is 98% water. Why can't you take in as much water as you want? We should have researched this I don't before. Know. After the event had concluded, Mrs. Strange called in sick to work and, according to her supervisor, said she had a terrible migraine. She was found dead in her home only hours after the contest had ended. Um, all right, now, Sacramento, California is another radio shock jock stunt where they got a couple of people um, to drink a lot of water, and one a woman who did that died. Roll the tape. After the events of the Wee Water Challenge, the local coroner's results attributed Jennifer's death to that of water intoxication. She left behind a loving family and her husband and was a result of negligence and poor decision making on behalf of KDND. See, on the surface of water intoxication issues, death may not seem like something that's even possible. Let's go back to the DJ's earlier comments about how the body is 98% water. So that means you can drink as much as you want, right? Unfortunately, in the case of Jennifer, drinking an immense amount of water as she did caused sodium to dissociate from her blood and the balance of her electrolytes became so out of whack that her brain essentially just shut down. Depending on the person, this can happen anywhere between one and four gallons of water, and the effects can transpire pretty quickly. 
The big question that arose from Jennifer Strange's death was who was to blame for the incident. A lawsuit was filed by Strange's husband, Billy, seeking $16.5 million in the loss of his wife and mother of their children. It was a preventable thing, he said. The radio station. They had the information months in advance that this could cause harm. So if this was the case, why wasn't anything done in advance to alert the contestants? Well, there was, kind of. Have you ever participated in a spicy food challenge at a local restaurant? The one that comes to mind for me is the waiver I had to sign to participate in the Blazing Challenge at Buffalo Wild Wings, where you basically eat a certain amount of the spiciest wing for a chance at, I think it was a shirt. The waiver appears to absolve the restaurant of any kind of responsibility for the contestant to sue them over bodily harm. See, KDND's Wee Water Contest had a similar waiver, but that wasn't the end of the story. You see, some of the information the radio station had become cognizant of wasn't included in the waiver nor explained to the people participating. So in a way, the real dangers of the contest were withheld altogether. In addition to this, the increased quantities of water consumed by the individuals later into the contest were not originally planned. Thus, the waiver was essentially negated. In November of 2009, after weeks of jury deliberation, the court found KDND guilty and awarded the family of Jennifer Strange $16 million as a result of the wrongful death suit. Billy acknowledged that he could not bring his wife back, but he hoped that the lawsuit would at least be a wake-up call to corporations all over the world to ensure nothing like this would ever happen again. It's certainly a tragic story, and unfortunately an extreme example of how desperate people will seemingly do anything to get their hands on the newest gaming craze. We can only hope that the events of Jennifer Strange and her family never happen again. Art is something that a wee brain individual such as myself will never fully understand. Some of the lengths that artists will go to to connect to their audience can be deeply cerebral or just plain nuts. Performance artists, however, are in a tier all of their own. They combine art with real life activities where the events and the world around them become the canvas. This can sometimes be quite impactful and has occasionally led to tragedy in stunned audiences. This next story worked to cross video games and art together, and let's just say the results were a bit odd. Jordan Wayne Long is a performance artist who grew up in Bald Knob, Arkansas, a place that isn't exactly known for its artistry. He spent most of his early years creating art that worked to evoke a wide array of emotions from its audience. He preferred performance art because it offered something that static paintings and pictures failed to do, provide real-time audience response and feedback, and it also allowed him to combine his artistic talents with a variation of method acting by putting himself in the zone of the art he aimed to create. It's certainly no secret how isolating our world can be. Just look at the rise of social media and online gaming, for example. Nowadays, people can go weeks on end without interacting with another human being face-to-face -face because of the supposed social connectivity created through the internet. In 2011, Jordan had an idea to combine the aspects of social isolation through video games and his performance art and do something drastic. He aimed to see how connected he could remain on the outside world while isolating his physical surroundings and playing an entirely online video game, Lord of the Rings Online. His plan was to stuff himself into an extremely small shipping box that conveniently fit in the back of a shipping van, equipped with only the clothes on his back, food, water, and his computer to play the Lord of the Rings online on. He would then travel 2,000 miles from his hometown in Arkansas to Oregon, where his performance act would be complete. The ultimate goal was to see what effects doing nothing but playing this game could provide, while staying isolated from the outside world. It's almost as though he attempted to mimic the lifestyle of a hikikomori, a group of Japanese individuals who live in complete isolation, whether by choice or extreme cases of agoraphobia. When interviewed for the reasoning behind this work, he said, To better understand post-traumatic stress disorder, many individuals who experience traumatic events fall victim to PTSD, a debilitating anxiety disorder that leads some to retreat to virtual worlds for comfort. 
Jordan's journey took place from July 1st to 7th, 2011, and is sporadically documented on his YouTube channel. It conveys some of the feelings he had throughout the trip and his live display of art after arriving in Oregon. One of the most shocking parts I observed from this video was just how small the shipping container was that he stuffed himself into. Not only that, but the video itself is filmed in low quality, and to me gives off a creepy or unsettling vibe with how it's spliced together. Hello everybody, this is July 5th, my second video update. My water bottle that was leaking, um, I got it turned upside down, and uh, I got my Breland mount, and got to shoot off fireworks last night in game for the fourth, and I uh, just running low on energy. Uh, but I expected that, so I get more protein bars for the next two days um, in preparation for the seventh. Uh, so that will be good. Unfortunately, there isn't much dialogue from Jordan available after his week long stunt was finished. He did receive accolades in the form of a Guinness World Record, but how well did his conditions emulate the post traumatic stress he was aiming to achieve? We may never know. I have my own doubts about his performance work because I feel like he lacked the prerequisites of PTSD to really incur any of the effects from the experiments. Would you really be able to digest the effectiveness of this contrived isolation, or was he just doing this act for show? Some of the other art that Jordan has compiled over his career led me to believe that he really sought to feel something from his gaming journey across the country. Similar stunts he had performed in the past included being drugged behind a car in the woods and being shocked by random passerbys in an art gallery. Sounds like a good time, huh? It's no secret that the alluring world of MMOs can become a welcome home for people to dwell in. Video games in general offer an escape from all the world's problems, a place where you can go to become whoever or whatever you want. Many people suffering from depression or other diseases use video games and online presence in general as the ultimate retreat and it can be quite beneficial and harmful as well. It's important that you don't forget yourself and stay safe out there. Almost every video game goes through some kind of alteration or shift in its narrative, story, or gameplay throughout development. Some of my favorite video game series, including Mother and Fallout, have each had major changes that affected the game's outcome, for better or for worse. Many times these changes will come out in the game's code, or perhaps you heard about its original design before a fast one was pulled and everything was changed. I'm looking at you, Earthbound64. But sometimes, well, sometimes we only hear about a game's alternate history through unconfirmed leaks and forum posts, leaving our minds to wander about the true intentions of the video game developers. Secret of Evermore was a game I played a decent amount of on the Super Nintendo as a kid. Set in a similar universe as Secret of Mana, I personally preferred Evermore for many reasons, including its apparent darker tone and music. In fact, one of the greatest video game music composers ever Jeremy Soule got his start working on the game, and Evermore went down as the first Square game produced entirely by the North American team. So, needless to say, they took a lot of liberties with the title. I'd be the first to tell you that something about Secret of Evermore seemed off. Sinister, almost. From the soundtrack cover, to the ominous title screen, to the enemies, and the just plain dark vibe the entire game gives off juxtaposed against some fanfarish music and quirky lines. It's almost as if something else was afoot when the game was being developed. And let's just say I wasn't the only one that held that opinion. On September 3rd, 2010, a random post was created on blogspot.com about Secret of Evermore's original story. Everything seemed pretty straightforward until a specific name is mentioned a few paragraphs into things. Ed Kahn. The author writes, Almost nobody knows of another person hired for the development team, a young 22-year-old writer by the name of Ed Kahn. Interestingly, he won the job through a writing contest put on in the search of a new young writer who could deliver the distinct American feel that Square had been looking for when they formed Square USA. 
This poster, Andrew, seems to suggest that Secret of Evermore actually originally had a darker tone due to a writer hired on by the team of the aforementioned name. The only problem? Well, Ed Kahn does not appear anywhere in the game's credits. Even more mysterious is that a simple Google search for the name Ed Kahn yields nothing of substance. Andrew mentions that he previously wrote a story entitled The Noise Coming From Inside Children, which also comes up with blank space searching throughout the internet's archives. Who is this Ed Kahn? And what did he originally envision for Secret of Evermore that ultimately got him released from the game's dev team entirely? Andrew expounds upon this theory by referencing comments made by Brian Fedreau, the lead programmer behind the game. We actually had to do a lot of work on text compression at the end. There was a huge amount of work that had to be done in that area for various reasons. I think in those final months, some guys did more work on text than they had done throughout its development. What exactly did these statements mean? Was this further proof that Secret of Evermore originally had dark tones written up by Ed Kahn? Or are these statements taken out of context? The last striking evidence the author laid down in his post was a screenshot of the game he took from a magazine. At first glance, these appear to be basic images from the story, but upon further examination, the dialogue in the rightmost screen cap reads, how can you live with what you've done? Those poor children. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't remember anything like this when playing through Secret of Evermore. In fact, there were plenty of disturbing moments in the game but I definitely would have remembered something like this. Neither the main character nor Fire Eyes actually ever recite this line in the game, even after combing through a long play I found on YouTube. Just nothing there that relates to it. Okay, so there are a few things in this blog post that could suggest that Secret of Evermore originally had a darker tone, but other than a generally creepy vibe from the game, some anonymous source from the dev team and a poorly rendered screenshot what real proof do we have that the game was made much darker? Well, as far as the Ed Kahn theory goes, the comments of this blog post alone can lead you to an answer. Although the first comment fuels the fire, confirming the existence of Kahn's terrifying story that got him noticed by the team, the rest of them look to do the opposite. In December of 2016, six years after this post was originally made, a Blogspot user claiming to be Alan Weiss, the second person attached to the Secret of Evermore project, replied to Andrew's original post, attempting to debunk the rumors of Ed Kahn's involvement. There was no Ed Kahn involved in Secret of Evermore. I should know. I was the concept producer and employee number two on the development team. The dialogue you see changing was created before the release of the game so that we could get reviews, and a lot of dialogue changed in the last few months as the game took its final shape. Even Brian Fedro, the one that I previously mentioned, the game's lead programmer, he appeared to drop into the comments as well, further dispelling the rumors put forth by Andrew. Although neither of these personalities can be proven, the way that they speak adds credibility to their knowledge of the project, including providing some images from development for other readers to look at. Diving even further into search results for the topic will lead back to Brian commenting on Reddit as to the falsehood of this story regarding Ed Kahn and the secret of Evermore's disturbing backstory. So that's it, right? We have two prominent members of Evermore's development team that adamantly dispel the existence of a darker tone and the mysterious scriptwriter. Honestly, I still have my doubts about this one. On one hand, we have no reason to believe Brian and Alan's comments were false, although I think there are some inconsistencies within Secret of Evermore that just don't make sense for how the game turned out. First of all, the art style and music do not seem to match the story very well. Even listening to the soundtrack now, all these years later, something just sticks with me about how the story played out. Perhaps it was merely a lack of concise communication on behalf of the dev team, but the tone of the music and the script did not mesh well. Maybe I'm reading too much into things. Maybe there is a secret no one has yet uncovered. I'll let you decide for yourself. Artificial Intelligence It's far and away one of the most fascinating things in our universe. 
whether it's a supercomputer that can take on the most cutthroat chess grandmasters in the world, or a randomly generated image based on search results, the world of AI is evolving at an incredibly rapid pace, and it's inevitable that many aspects of our daily lives will end up being replaced or made easier by our automated technological advances. In the world of video games, artificial intelligence has existed mostly in the form of bots, characters that exist in games to mimic a real player posing a challenge to gamers playing something locally. Sometimes the bots in video games are absolute trash, like playing a CPU at a level of one in Super Smash Bros., but some games have gone above and beyond their Call of Duty to adapt to the user's playstyle and consistently produce bots that challenge even the most skilled players. When it comes to bots utilized in early first-person shooters, they tend to come off as a bit creepy. This is especially true in games like The World Is Not Enough and Quake 3. The latter mentioned game actually has become quite infamous for its use of AI over the years, but there are a couple of specific examples of this that sent chills down my spine. In 2018, Quake 3's AI was paired with Google's DeepMind to create an incredibly intelligent AI for the simple goal of challenging real human players in online games. The results were honestly quite terrifying. What's interesting about DeepMind as opposed to the original OpenAI is that there's no access to raw numerical data, but instead they rely on absorbed visual on-screen inputs, kind of like you would do if you were a human. So you essentially have this AI that develops a muscle memory of sorts. The AI agents were given no instructions and were essentially let loose on their server to learn and adapt to their surroundings. The results were staggering. The DeepMind AI bot spent 37,500 sped up hours of gameplay within a stripped down version of Capture the Flag in Quake 3, an estimated 450,000 games played. Then the bots hosted a tournament against professional and casual human players, resulting in a 2v2 74% win rate. The humans were undeniably impressed and found it almost disturbing how closely the AI mimicked how a real human would react and play the game. The creepy factor was only further amped up in this Reddit post I found while scavenging for Quake 3 AI data. One user created a dedicated server for the AI to play each other on and continue to learn from their mistakes. Somehow he mentions that he left the server stagnant for several years and when he came back to it, something was extremely off. When he dropped into the game, the bots appeared to be malfunctioning as they didn't really move at all. When he reloaded a new game, assuming they had crashed, his suspicions were furthered as the AI once again remained stagnant. Finally, the anonymous user dropped into the game himself and still the bots appeared to do absolutely nothing. Or did they? Once he started moving around, the bots began to track his movement with their bodies, indicating that they had become so advanced they were literally just waiting for him to make his move before doing anything. After playing thousands of hours on a dedicated server, had the bots honestly deduced that the smartest play would be to sit and do nothing? Although the legitimacy of this Reddit post is undoubtedly in question, the adaptability of Quake 3's AI is something that is really well known around the PC gaming community. Could AI and video games actually become so good they can constantly beat humans in a head-to-head -head environment? What's probably the most terrifying to me is that Google DeepMind produced AI that was able to adapt to certain situations if I carry out a pre-programmed script. This means that in a way, they were thinking like humans. I included a link to the full study and article below. And at the end of the day, AI only continues to advance in our society. It will be beyond our capabilities at some point and more than any of us thought possible. Perhaps Skynet really will exist one day. So I've definitely saved the craziest story for last. And for how complex this is, I haven't seen a terrible amount of coverage on it. If you've been on the weird part of the internet for some time, you may have heard the term ARG, or alternate reality game. In short, these are embellished fictional tales that are normally embedded within the internet in some form of social media. ARGs come in all shapes and sizes, and most of them have some sort of a sinister or mysterious tone. 
but not all ARGs are created equal. In fact, the ARG or Easter egg ARG I'm about to talk about is one of, if not the most elaborate one I've ever seen and involves the most unassuming game in existence, the Trials series. Trials HD was a game released on Xbox 360 in 2009 that worked to mimic real motorcycle trials, just with a lot of obstacles and physics. It was one of the most popular games in the booming Xbox Live Arcade service, and gamers couldn't get enough of challenging themselves to countless trials throughout their playthroughs. But a bit after the game's release, hints surfaced about a riddle lingering within the game's many levels, which was ultimately discovered after internet detectives started looking. Trials Evolution was the follow-up released in April 2012. Soon after its release, players started to discover hidden clues to a riddle invented by creative director Antti Elvisuo. Throughout the game, random letters can be discovered on wooden planks, which for the most part may seem unassuming, but Trials Riddle Hunters knew there was something more to it. Once all the letters were arranged together in chronological order throughout the game, they formed a cipher of sorts that looked like complete gibberish. However, somehow, a longtime Trials fan, Murdoch Locke, had been reading up on a specific type of cipher, which are basically codes where if one word is guessed, it's possible to crack and translate chunks of coded message. He decided to take a guess at what one of the words might be, and don't you know, he was right. Here's the description of his efforts in his own words. I was pretty sure the last word was actually right, so by plugging it into the decrypt box and using the key right, I got urban, which seemed like it was unscrambled, so I tried to guess the word before, which was OMXM. So now in the decrypt box, I have a bunch of gibberish. At this point, I know I'm on the right path. I keep working backwards in this fashion, so I've revealed the entire code portion of the cipher. Using the following key, I then decrypted it to is case no mechanical disturbin? Kind of weird. So I put this into Google and the fourth hit down in the preview text, I see the bold words in perfect succession. It's a Wikipedia page for the Bohr-Einstein debates. If your head wasn't already spinning, things get much more complicated. Next, he decided to take the entire sentence that that portion of the key was found in and he removed the spaces and punctuation so he was left with the following sentence. He plugged that into the key and the text from the signs into the encrypted message box. And voila, the cipher was broken. Given the magical stroke of genius on display by this guy, the final decoded cipher read as follows. In-game music to zero from the game options. Nature calls with Scorpion. Start and pass the first checkpoint Leap from the rock and stop on the next rock. Push the right stick. Up, down, up, down, up, down, left, right. This part was much easier to solve. The Riders of Doom DLC for Trials Evolution features a specific track called Nature Calls, and one of the motorcycle names was the Scorpion. So obviously, this involved performing the trick listed in the last part of the message with the in-game music volume set at zero, using the Scorpion on Nature Calls. Piece of cake! The following video shows what happens when the instructions are followed in the solved cipher. Let's take a look. Now, if you're asking me, that's an epic enough song on its own and a viable Easter egg. But things were just getting started. Let's take a closer listen to the actual lyrics in this Easter egg. The lyrics within this song actually invited you to take a closer listen. And using a technique known as spectral analysis, hidden Morse code was discovered in the song. The Morse code ended up being translated to the phrase check song spectra in each song. Well. Back to spectral analysis we go, I guess. Fortunately enough for the Trials Riddle community, most of the songs analyzed contained the same Morse code snippets. 
This translated to a very interesting website address, www.fixedpatternencodes.com. At the time of this riddle's unfolding, typing in this address would bring you to a screen with a staticky image present that looked like this. Somehow, someone figured out that if you take the background image that's seen on this website from the CSS page and overlay it on the top of the main image GIF in Photoshop using an exclusion filter, you get this crazy Latin message. When translated, this message reads as a poem from an ancient Greek scholar. The poem focuses on the existence of natural phenomena by way of chance rather than a Roman deity and ponders on the very evolution of mankind. Oh, trials evolution. I get it. Basically, you know, deep stuff. And yeah, all this stems from a game about motorcycles. In late 2013, things started to get really interesting. On the aforementioned site, images began appearing daily and changing, each different from the last. But rather than them being all science related, no one could establish the connection. It wasn't until the end of the drop of images that one keen observer realized that these images were actually a clue to an individual, a scientist to be specific, and their name spelled out the alphabet. After all 26 letters were revealed, we were presented with an image in a box asking for an answer. Then on October 9th, 2013, using a quick comparison of symbols and their corresponding letters, the phrase big freeze with no complete end, a reference to one of the possible theories of the ending of the universe was put into the text box. The following screen was then revealed. Four locations scattered around the world with exact geographic coordinates illustrating where something would be located. Sydney, San Francisco, Helsinki, and Bath, locations that don't necessarily seem tied together, each with their own mysterious treasure awaiting. The worldwide hunt for the trial's Easter egg got a whole lot bigger. Ironically, the first of these happened to be discovered mere hours after the image was first posted online. One Trials fan by the name of Bat Guy happened to live in Sydney, Australia, and offered to lend a hand. After an initial failed attempt due to public access being blocked, he went back to the location identified in the image at night, with less people around. And after a brief search, he came across a small chest, containing an old looking key and metal plaque with a quote from John Green. On the other side of the plaque read something even more mysterious. Midday in year 2113, first Saturday in August, one of five keys will open the box underneath the Eiffel Tower. So according to this message, one of the keys opened some sort of box 100 years after the game was released. First of all, there were only four locations listed on the Cypher's website, but the phrase mentions one of five keys. Was there still more to this riddle that was left unanswered? Remember this, we'll get back to it later. The second big question is, why 100 years? If this truly was the case, no one that is alive right now playing Trials Evolution would even be around to see this secret come to fruition. I mean, heck, some of our kids won't even be around. I'm not gonna lie, this aspect made me a bit sad because it kind of closed the door on the secret in a way. Was this Easter egg really that important that it would impact future generations of gamers and become a piece of internet history? The search through the other three locations continued. Lord Melkett, a Trials community member, was the person that recovered the hidden package in Bath. The coordinates led him to a cemetery on the outskirts of the city, and the clue directed him toward the grave of Henry Herbert Hale. And much like the package discovered in Sydney, this one also had a similar key and note. The San Francisco package was the hardest of all to find. The brave soul attempting the discovery, Maurice, basically used GPS coordinates to head out to the middle of nowhere, and well, he started digging, and digging, and digging. In fact, due to poor cell reception and apparent lack of preparation, Maurice ended up going back and forth from the same location five times before finally finding the package buried in the dirt. And judging by the way it looked, it had been there for quite some time. The last location listed on the image was that of Helsinki, Finland. This was the largest of the locations, so naturally people thought it held the most significance, which being the hometown of the Red Lynx team behind the Trials games made sense. The address listed in the clue turned out to be the office of the popular Finnish gaming magazine, Gamer. When he arrived, he was handed a metal plate and three pieces of paper. 
The documents were 300-year-old French papers relating to a land sale and loan money for a French property from the 1700s. And that led to some coordinates and another location in Helsinki where some digging was done. And what do you know? There's actually way more than just a key here. There's a larger box of goodies, including a pocket watch from the early 1900s and some other cool stuff. So is that it? Wait, the fifth key. So of course the trials evolution riddle couldn't be fully completed without adding one more convoluted element, right? We had one key in each of the four locations listed on the website, but what of the fifth? Gamers searched far and wide with their savvy internet detective skills, searching for the elusive clues to the key, and absolutely nothing was found. That was until the next game in the franchise was released, Trials Fusion. Just a quick scan of the achievement list revealed something called the fifth key. See, by traversing through the track editor, you can find a random key floating in the air, and it's digital. So how could this key possibly open a physical box underneath the Eiffel Tower 100 years from now? Well, your guess is as good as mine. As to how the creative director remains true to his promise, this interview was posted by Kotaku in late 2014, asking him about the Eiffel Tower clue. Is it true? Like, is it actually going to happen? Yes. That's so unfair, but yes, I, mean, I made sure that in 100 years, in a way that obviously I hope that those kind of relatives, yep. people who have, they come here, but I made sure that something happens yep. in the exact time yep. of the people who have the keys. Yep. For all intents and purposes, it appears that he actually made specific arrangements for this secret to be delivered in 2113. But will we even remember by then? Will our descendants even care? What does the fifth key have to do with the box? What if one of the keys is lost? What if that's the one that opens the box? Unfortunately, this is something none of us will ever get the chance to discover, making this incredibly fun and detailed ARG quite depressing. What do you think the secret holds? Is it some sort of treasure? Some lost concepts from the trial series? Let me know in the comments below. For now, we sit and wonder about the future discoveries laid out by the most unsuspecting game. I hope you enjoyed this dive into five more strange gaming stories. Be sure to let me know what you thought of some of them in the comments below. Be sure to send me an email or DM on Twitter if you have better ideas for future gaming stories. I love researching these strange tales of gaming history. As always, this has been Press Start to Continue, and I'll see you next time.